How many decisions have you made today? <laughs> Hundreds? Researchers at Cornell found we make over 200 decisions each day about food alone. It's tough to say how many, but we make thousands of decisions every day. Have you ever made a poor decision you later regretted? <laughs> Did anyone climb on the roof this winter to shovel off the snow? <laughs> I hope no one got hurt. Don't we all do things that in hindsight we wish we had slowed down a bit before making the decision to move forward? Slowing down is what I want to talk to you about today. Especially with my outdoor pursuits, where not slowing down and making rushed decisions can have major consequences. One of the places I make many decisions is in the wilderness surrounding Central Oregon. I'm a climber, skier, and board member of the Central Oregon Avalanche Association. COA helps people every day make better decisions in the backcountry by providing current weather, snowpack, and avalanche information on our website. We also educate people about the human factor, the concept that we are all human, and humans sometimes make mistakes. On January 23rd, 2010, I met up with a new partner I'd never skied with before in Sisters, Oregon. We made hundreds of decisions that day. Some of those decisions were slow and calculated, while others were automatic and intuitive. A few of those decisions were biased or fraught with error, resulting in a brush with disaster. Like any new relationship, my partner and I were sizing each other up as we headed into the Cascade Mountains. Skiing with a new partner is a little bit like going out on a first date. I was wondering what he was thinking. He was likely doing the same and neither of us knew for sure what was going on in either person's head. We didn't know each other's patterns or habits, and it was difficult to pick up on subtle feelings, cues, or emotions. My partner was ahead of me as we approached the slope on Middle Sister from behind. The scene was stunning, and I was taking pictures of the surrounding peaks blanketed by the clouds. When I approached the slope, my partner had his video camera out. I had a funny feeling in my gut as I looked down the slope but didn't allow time for that to process. As I began preparing myself to ski, my partner said, you go first. <laughs> I felt rushed, but didn't want to slow the progress any further. So I quickly ripped off my skins and said, okay, as I began my descent, and here's what transpired. Wow. Still gives me the chills to watch that over seven years later. People often ask me if I was scared riding down that moving slab of snow. Honestly, I wasn't scared. I didn't have time to be scared or to check in with my emotions. I was just instinctively reacting and fighting like hell to get off the moving slab. The feeling that stands out the most when I caught my breath at the end of the ride, however, was disappointment. I was disappointed in myself for making the decision to ski that slope. I had over 20 years of mountain experience leading up to that day and had made so many good decisions in the mountains. I felt as though I had let my guard down and also felt very vulnerable at the same time. After reflecting a great deal on being caught in an avalanche, the main lesson I learned from that day was to slow down. I'm convinced that if we had processed all of the information gathered earlier in the day about the snowpack, assessed the current slope, and had a good conversation with my partner, we wouldn't have skied that slope. The next time you are about to make a risky decision, like getting behind the wheel after one drink too many, slow down and weigh the consequences of your actions. Climbing and skiing has been a huge part of my life the past 25 years, and it has shaped who I am today. We assume a certain amount of risk adventuring in the mountains. I often ask myself, why do I climb and ski mountains if it is so risky? There's an obvious tension with risk being the probability of loss or gain, and the mountains have so much to give. The challenge, the solitude, the views, 
The highs and lows are all reasons I love spending time in the mountains. Painting a skin track across a landscape. Climbing a white canvas. Floating above the clouds on the summit. And arcing turns down the mountain are all powerful experiences. The creative process of photographing these fleeting moments is my way of slowing down to permanently capture these feelings. The mountains can also take so much. My first ski mountaineering experience was with my friend Hansari in 1996. We were both rock and ice climbers just getting into backcountry skiing. Hans and I decided to climb the frozen waterfall named the Green Gully in Montana to ski the snow slope above. Maybe not surprisingly, we were the first to think skiing this line was a good idea. <laughs> we precariously strapped our skis to our packs, climbed the ice, and took turns post-holing up the deep snow in the gully. Working together in harmony to achieve a common goal makes mountain partnerships very special. We finished skiing in the twilight, had a magical experience repelling the waterfall as darkness was settling into Paradise Valley. I lived with Hans and Bozeman for a couple of years in the 90s with several other climbers and skiers. Hans was a renaissance skier. He played the cello and was a chess master. He had a computerized chess board that he would play for hours on end, often winning at the highest setting. He graduated from Yale with a degree in philosophy and loved spaghetti. <laughs> Literally every night he loved spaghetti. <laughs> Hans was an incredible person and had so much stoke. He was a writer with a gift of weaving his passions into his literary work. He once wrote, to carve turns, deliberately and skillfully creates the line. Like a cello, there is no sound until the string is taut. The more you struggle, the tighter the string, the greater the music. I'm here today because I've been lucky on more than one occasion in the mountains. Sadly, Hans was not so lucky. His ski slid out from underneath him, attempting to ski a steep slope called the Gervasudi Coulard in Chamonix, France. I think about Hans often and can feel his presence and energy, not only here today, but every time I go into the backcountry. I regret never telling Hans what a great friend he was, so make sure you slow down and tell all the people around you how much you care about them because you never know when they will be gone. My daughter Liv was born a little over a year ago. <laughs> Looking at awe at Liv and reflecting on my narrow escapes and on seven friends lost to avalanches and other mountain accidents, that's when it really hit me. Slow down. Appreciate every moment because life passes by so quickly. Last year at TEDx Bend, Liv was nine days old and slept through the entire event on my chest. Today she is walking, jabbering, has skied a handful of times and is listening intently in the audience. <laughs> I love you, Liv. I'm constantly reminding myself to cherish every moment because I know in the blink of an eye, she will be heading off to college. This winter, I decided to slow down and pay better attention to snowflakes. And what a winter it was. <laughs> or is. <laughs> I love snow. As a physics and engineering professor at Central Oregon Community College, my students and I discover how snowflakes form and eventually create a complex snowpack that may be capable of producing an avalanche. I began capturing images of snowflakes with my iPhone and a magnifying scope. The intricate beauty and detail is mesmerizing. 
takes about 15 minutes for a snowflake to form. It all begins with a liquid water droplet forming around a dust particle. Ice chemistry defines the six-sided nature of the snowflake. Physics takes over as the snowflake grows. Temperature and humidity are the two key variables shaping the snowflake. High humidity creates long, slender branching structures, creating stellar dendrites, while lower humidity produces broad, flat, faceted features seen in these sectored plates. Considering how many different temperature and humidity regions a snowflake travels through from start to finish, the probability that any two snowflakes are identical is zero. Averaged over a typical year, about a million billion snowflakes fall to the ground every second. No two are alike. It just blows my mind to think of the infinite beauty. When I look at snowflakes, I get into a zen-like flow state. I become present and all of the cares in the world melt away. When my students and I slow down and soak up the intricacies of each flake, we feel connected to each other and to the universe. Recently, my friend Tosh Roy and I spent 19 hours together climbing and skiing Mount Bachelor, Broken Top, South, Middle, and North Sister in a single push. We covered approximately 36 miles and climbed and skied about 32,000 feet of elevation. Maybe also not surprisingly, we were the first to think this was a good idea. <laughs> I've known Tosh for over 15 years and was one of his Nordic skiing coaches when he was in middle school. We experienced many highs and lows on that day, helping each other out along the way. I will never forget that day. Together we ascended a steep slope on Broken Top in the dark, watched the sun rise as we headed towards South Sister, skied perfect corn down the Prouty Glacier, and looked out at awe at the vast expanse of nature from the summit of Middle Sister. We made many good decisions that day and were completely in the flow state. 19 hours passed in an instant. As we neared the end of the day and realized for the first time we were going to accomplish our goal, our pace slowed way down. Pausing in that moment was a powerful experience. Walking slowly on the dirt the last half mile to the trailhead, I thought back on the past five years of planning, training, and several failed attempts, and realized in that moment that spending quality time in the mountains that day with Tosh was more important than completing our goal. Our friendship and connection grew stronger as a result of this experience, and I'm grateful for that time we shared together. I've learned many valuable lessons from climbing and skiing mountains and observing snow, and I want to leave you today with one simple message. Slow down. Slow down to the pace of snowflakes forming and falling gently from the sky. Slow down to make good decisions and to connect on a deeper level to nature, to friends, and to loved ones. Slow down, be present, and live every moment. Thank you. <laughs>